Psychoanalysis and Feminism The debate between psychoanalysis and feminism has been long and often acrimonious. Although it begins with the discussions of the so-called phallic stage of development that took place in the 1920s and 1930s, it took on a new importance in the 1970s as questions of gender and its reproduction came to the fore, and as feminists, such as Juliet Mitchell, reacted against the anti-psychoanalytic stance taken by many of the early spokeswomen for women liberation. The literature on psychoanalysis and feminism is now so extensive, and the debate so far-reaching as to have become the subject of a valuable critical dictionary. In her pioneering work titled, The Feminine Mystique, Betty Friedan argued that psychoanalysis was one of the major sources of the mystique of her title, which persuaded women to collude in their own domination by men. Simone de Beauvoir, for her part, had already described psychoanalysis as encouraging, or even engineering social, conformity that was detrimental to women's interests. Kate Millett, Shulamith Firestone, and Germaine Greer were all agreed that psychoanalysis was part of the ideology of patriarchy. A major shift occurred when Juliet Mitchell began to contend that, far from being a prescription for patriarchy, psychoanalysis offered a theory of patriarchy and gender that could contribute to the liberation of women. Precedents for both sides of the argument can be found in the writings of Sigmund Freud himself. On the one hand, he states quite badly that anatomy is destiny, and explains the little girl's sense of inferiority in terms of the narcissistic wound inflicted by her realization that she does not have a penis. Elsewhere he argues that, whilst psychoanalysis cannot describe what a woman is, it can help to elucidate how she comes into being, how a woman develops out of a child with a bisexual disposition. Despite this claim, Freud's writings are full of metaphors of darkness and obscurity that help to turn femininity into a dark continent, which is almost impossible to understand. It was the references to a sense of inferiority, and the stress on penis envy, which defined women as incomplete males, that were so offensive to writers like Millet. The Freudian notion of penis envy was the central issue in the early debates over the phallic phase, or that stage in psychosexual development in which children of both genders believe in the existence of only one genital organ. The girl's realization that she does not have a penis leads her to conclude that she once had one but has been castrated, and she then embarks on the long process of feminization, which will lead her to transform her wish for the penis into a wish for a child. Arguing that the psychoanalysis that so offended many feminists was in fact a vulgarized, or revisionist version of Freud, Mitchell and others, like Jacqueline Rose contend that Jacques Lacan's return to Freud offered a solution. Others suggested that feminism was in danger of being seduced by psychoanalysis. Lacan's main contributions to the debate are the concepts of the symbolic, the phallus, and the name of the father, which do move the discussion away from the biologism of Freud's remarks about anatomy and destiny. However, these concepts also create new problems. In fact, it is difficult to find precedents for the use of phallus, rather than penis in Freud, and the link that is established by Lacan between the phallus and access to the symbolic is vulnerable to Jacques Derrida's accusation of phallogocentrism. The importance ascribed to the name of the father can, for its part, be seen as a rearguard action against the greater emphasis that is placed on mothering by Melanie Klein, Donald Winnicott, and Nancy Chodorov. Whilst elements of Lacanian psychoanalysis have become an essential part of certain forms of feminism, and certainly of some feminist criticism, critics, such as Luce Irigere, argue that both its basic epistemology and its practices are inherently masculinist.